So welcome everyone to my talk about uh, yet another build systems for embedded systems. Um, so this talk is going to be a little bit a mixture of um, looking at it from a user perspective, which we did and are still doing, but also a little bit about promoting it because we're also interested that this thing is working. So this is roughly the structure of my talk. Well, I'm going to explain, of course, first of all, what, why we are doing yet another build systems, uh, the build system for embedded devices. Um, would like to introduce you to this system called ESA, or ISAR in English, but ESA, you know why later on. Um, present you a little bit first steps, how to get running with it, and then look into the customizations that you usually do if you build your own embedded system, and how these could be done in, in ESA. Um, well, derive some to-dos for this project from it and give it an outlook and summarize the talk. So if you look at embedded systems, how they are being built out of their, their inputs these days, they are basically, well, I would say two directions. One is this roll your own thing, um, doing it out of source tree, out of the sources. Uh, like Open Embedded is doing, like Yocto is doing, like BuildRoot, and you can extend the list uh, very long. Um, that usually implies that you are doing cross builds if you are targeting a different architecture, but even if you're doing the same architecture, you may have the need to cross build because your tool chain may differ. So often the tool chain bootstrap is included. It gives you a high flexibility regarding um, the customization um, of your system, of course. Um, but if you look at the increasingly complex systems we have these days, which are getting more and more closer to, to desktops and, and server installations, um, the production times, of course, also go up uh, significantly because you build everything from source code. And also one thing people tend to forget, well, not the experts, that you have, of course, still a, a certain dependency on your host system, on your build system where you're running on. So it doesn't solve the problem of this as well. And then there are more and more embedded-based embed -based, um, systems for embedded devices these days, uh, distribution-based uh, based systems. So their approach is basically to take what we have already, the ecosystems, from the desktop, from the server area, and, and use the distributions established there, try to fit them into embedded devices. That's getting more and more easier with the standardization of the hardware. Um, and it's actually not that new and to say, well, if you look at the list here, um, there are many of these uh, systems, well, some of these systems are a bit older, like uh, LV, um, but also the distributions realize these days that they could scale down. If you think of IoT scenarios, um, there's more and more interest in enabling these distributions to go for the smaller devices. So small may vary, but yeah, there's a trend, so to say. Um, so the idea is to install from pre-built binaries, not build everything from source, um, that may lead, of course, to larger images. Um, that may mean that you have a slower boot time unless you apply certain customizations again. So be so doing some kind of post-processing on the normal distribution installation. Between both, there's something like a, a hybrid solution, a hybrid approach, interestingly. Uh, it's uh, representing Meta Debian here. Um, maybe there are some others, but this is basically what I'm aware of. Um, that uses distribution packages uh, in their source form, but rebuild them using a classic um, yeah, from source distribution building system, like, like Yocto in this case. Um, well, so they, they try to combine benefits from both sources, uh, but of course they also have some downsides. That means, for example, that you have to write your own recipes in this case um, to yeah, import these, these sources. So, if you look at what, what we really need, um, I would say this is some kind of list of general requirements on embedded uh, system builders. Um, so in the end, you want to have some ready-to-use image for your device. May it be on an SD card, may it be flashable directly into the internal flash or something like this. You want to have this done in one step, more or less, or at least the output should be ready and not really like you have, for example, with some server systems where you have to do some post-processing on the device. That's something that you can replicate easily, that you can then deploy in your production phase to your embedded device and be done with it. Um, well, 
it has to be reproducible naturally if you are doing this professionally. Um, you want to have to replicate, you, don't, you have to replicate the results. Uh, you have to be able to reproduce the results after a longer period. For us, often it uh, could be a decade or even longer, where you have to be able to reproduce what you've done before in the past. Um, you have to integrate uh, further sources, not just from this distribution. Well, it's real life. You have your business logic, so you your own application possibly running on this. You have third parties coming in. Not everything comes from this one source. And well, if you look at our domain, um, well, we usually don't do just one device. We do many. They are similar. Um, they have some overlap. Um, so you have to deal with something like the, uh, the similarity in these uh, devices. You don't want to do everything from scratch over and over again. So product line development, um, reusable components, and also configuration artifacts. That's yeah, one goal for this. And in the end, of course, yeah, you want to have a, a quick bootstrap, uh, food, quick start for your beginner developers on this who want to have to deal with it. But it also has to be powerful and extensible for those the experts and doing a real complex product out of it. We specifically, Siemens has some additional requirements, but I guess they're also shared to some other companies as well. Um, it turned out that we really would like, on the long run, to avoid um, building everything from source. Um, well, there is already a pool of uh, pre-built packages available. Um, we want to reuse them as far as possible, because one of the things that you lose if you do everything from source yourself uh, you use the, the QA that upstream uh, distributions already did on their packages. Um, you can easily lose them because you just very little bit on your, on your tool chain, on your build process and everything. So you get basically, you come up with your own distribution, yes, and that's an advantage, but it's often also a disadvantage. From the QA perspective, it can be a disadvantage. Um, yeah, and as our systems are increasingly, getting increasingly complex, the requirements, um, the features that they would include, also, the, the number of packages, the dependencies that they pull in also increase. So a simple system can already contain a few hundred packages or even up to, well, some thousand packages. So this is something which uh, goes bigger and bigger. Um, if you look at what, what kind of components you pull in from the server, from the mobile development and things like this, um, yeah, it's just, it's just counting, basically. And eventually, you will uh, have longer and longer production times for your system. Uh, furthermore, as we are in the markets where uh, we have to support the products for a very long time, as I mentioned, this 10 years is just the, the lower bound, so to say. Um, we want to use more of the established um, long-term maintenance process that exists typically with distributions, which are not that common yet for the source-based um, distribution builders, often because, well, they can't really handle all the variation that you can build out of this. And last but not least, also very important for us, um, is the, uh, the license compliance, the OSS license compliance. Um, that means that you follow the obligation that the open source license is put on you. And that, of course, means you have to first of all understand what licenses actually are involved. And often that's not that trivial just by looking at the package and looking at the, the top level copying file that may reflect the truth, but it may also be only part of the truth. Um, and that's also very important that you have a source um, from upstream, from your distribution, or wherever it comes from, where this kind of information has been gathered very carefully already, and you can, you can build on this. You don't have to do the work. Okay, so if we want to build um, on top of a distribution, the question is, of course, which one to pick? And that's a little bit like, yeah, which editor to pick? Um, so we can discuss about a lot of these things, um, but let's say, okay, we picked one, um, for the time being, that's um, Debian, and well, that doesn't mean that others are bad or have, cannot fulfill all these requirements as well, but this is simply just the way to go for now. Um, why Debian? Well, first of all, it's a large community-driven ecosystem, very established, it's proven to be there and stay there. Um, it's, it's increasingly popular embedded as well. So if you look at, well, the recipes, but also others like the Armbian um, flavors of Debian, um, they more and more become popular on these embedded devices. Um, well, not to under, underestimate, uh, we have some experience of Debian before. So we are shipping products, uh, embedded products, where Debian is included. Doesn't mean that all our Linux products are Debian-based, but some of them are. So this apparently seems to work, even without all the tiny features on top, like 
standardized uh, build system for these kind of devices. So they are all doing their image production in, well, an efficient way for the specific product, but all a little bit different. Yeah, well, another advantage of Debian is long-term support. Well, this is, of course, something that other distributions have as well. Not all, but many. Um, but very interesting, as I mentioned before, is the strict license check that Debian applies. Debian does it for the, the reason that they want to ensure that they only have real free software included. Nothing which is, well, violating these goals. Um, that implies, of course, they have to check the licenses as well and find out if there are something, well, inconsistencies or, well, not applicable um, packages. So they do some work which is valuable for us as well from the perspective that we want to build on top of well worked out license description of a package. And last but not least, Debian is something which scales down, can scale down to small sizes, maybe not as small as you build your own Linux from scratch, um, and it also can scale up. So if your embedded system becomes bigger and bigger, adds features, you know, basically grow with this uh, packaging system that you have. So this is where the ESA project comes into play. So ESA actually is a new project being released in October, something like this last year, uh, but actually has a longer history. And the history starts with something which is called, or was, was called Slint. Depending on your point of view, it was the Siemens or the small Linux distribution. Uh, a Debian-based attempt at that time needed um, in order to get Linux from a distribution uh, source into embedded devices. Um, well, that is what even colleagues before I joined Siemens uh, worked on for quite a while. Um, Slint um, became, well, it, it came into some products, but eventually, of course, the community became bigger than what we can, uh, were able to build. Um, so Slint uh, basically phased out uh, but still it was in, in one product present, or in one uh, set of product present, um, and, and it evolved a little bit. Uh, and it also involved in regarding how the, it was being produced, so how the image was being produced. Starting from a script in the early days, later on someone implemented a bit bake on top of this for these specific products. So at the point, um, then later on as a slint, as a yeah, cross-building um, version of Debian, became less interesting because of the maintenance effort. Um, this specific product series switched over to pure Debian, but kept the bitbake part of this. And finally, in last year is basically when we started as a, as a central department of Siemens look into the options how to get Debian integrated into more than one uh, Siemens device or more than one Siemens product series. Um, we basically got in touch again with those people did, doing the, um, the, the early stages of, of ESA development, and that is a, a company called uh, Ilbos, um, who's doing this or was doing this kind of development for a specific division of Siemens, and then said, oh, boy, wait, um, we already have something which is conceptually possibly interesting for you. Um, we just have to make it open source. And that's the point, basically, we came together and said, okay, let's try to evolve from this product-specific development something which could be useful as an open source project and could be shared by others. Of course, that means that, well, a lot of things have to be a little bit done differently simply because they were done for a specific purpose so far and not for a generic use case. So we spawned that, uh, the open source release, which was done technically by Ilbus. And it was called ESA. So what is ESA? Well, it's an integrated system for automated uh, root file system generation. And you see it's already a little bit, uh, <laughs> it's not completely expressing what the term is. Um, it's also a nice place to have barbecue in Munich. Uh, well, it's the river floating along this side, actually. So ESA is the river for, uh, flowing through, through Munich. Um, so this is basically where the name comes from. ESA is uh, trying to combine the best of three worlds. One of the world is a Debian-based system that delivers you all the packages you want to include, at least most of them, uh, with an integration tool, uh, Bitbake, which is well established um, in building distributions and highly flexible, we'll see it later on, um, plus the way Yocto um, structures um, the description of embedded systems and also enables certain workflows. 
So this is basically pulling these kind of information together and in building something valuable out of this. How it looks like, using an example of an ARM target. So we first of all have um, yeah, the Debian repository, upstream repository, and we built, um, uh, built TH root out of this. Um, yeah, we're to being able to, to build further, aspect, uh, further elements of your, of your target device. Specifically, you normally have some parts of your device which are not coming from binary packages, but have to be built, actually. And that's, well, in this case, a hello, so your example application in this case, but it can, of course, be more complex. Um, so this is being as put as an input. Um, can be a Git repository, a source repository, which being built then in this environment and generating then a Debian package out of this. So basically filling the gap that upstream Debian is not providing. Um, and you also use uh, um, the Debian tooling to create um, the root file system for your target. That's uh, multistrap in this case. Um, and yeah, this, this pulls together the standard root file system parts from the binary packages, plus those packages which are custom made. And typically in embedded systems beside the business logic, that is maybe a bootloader, that is most often the kernel, and these things then are put together, installed, and creating a root file system image. And last but not least in this chain, of course, there is the generation of the bootable image, um, that's also part of the, the ESA logic, um, and in the end, so you end up with a bootable, directly bootable image in this production chain. So if you want to try out ESA, um, these are the first steps, the first, uh, yeah, tries to, to get something running, on a, in this case, on a QEMA machine, for example. So um, it requires, first of all, a Debian built environment, so a host environment. Um, can be the host itself um, or a virtual machine. Clone the repository, it's on GitHub. And then bootstrap your environment, similar to what, what Yocto are doing, and open embedded. Um, and then fire up the build process via Bitbake, specifying um, the image you want to build. In this case, with the multi-config feature, you could also specify the, um, the, the machine you're building for or you do it like the Yocto normal way via configuration files. And yeah, for this demo, start up um, the virtual machine, so start up a QEMU emulator where this image is being booted then. So that's the one case. We also have a case for uh, testing on physical hardware. Um, so this is for the Raspberry Pi 1s in this case. Uh, that uses uh, directly the Raspbian repository as source and not just Debian. Um, well, same approach basically, just a different target to build, and then you can directly write to an SD card and have your bootable image. So how does ESA look like internally? This is the structure, the top level view of this. Um, if you check out, you basically have this kind of folders and, and files in your repository. Um, so first of all, there's Bitbake, the tool well known and uh, yeah, support or um, maintained out of free, so we just copy this in, update it once in a while, there are no patches on it, just standard. Um, then there is the, the core layer, the meter layer, um, and there is an, a template layer available, meter ether, which is uh, yeah, providing you some examples and also enabling the, uh, the bootstrap processes I, I showed on the slide before. There's a script folder with some additional helper scripts, and then there is this bootstrap script available on the top level. So if you want to start your own project with this, um, one way is to just clone the repository as it's there. Um, you will find this meter ether layer there and, and use it as a template. So copy it, modify it, and yeah, well, add what you normally do in building your own device. That's uh, your own image description with your own list of packages and possibly also your own board machine that you want to describe for your target. That's one way. Or if you want to do it more sophisticated with a more complex system, that's of course what we are targeting for is um, yeah, create your own repository with your own layer or your own set of layers, um, which just basically then includes either as, a, as an upstream source like you would do this with Yocto you have the unmodified um, Yocto repository, the poker repository, and just include it 
um, and add additional layers on top of this. That may mean that you need to probably some configuration management for all these sets of repositories um, like a repo or other tools. So then you can start using the normal layer mechanisms that you know from, possibly know from Yocto. Um, you have different kind of sources of, of input you add to this. So you may have uh, bot support package um, layers. You may have layers with specific libraries coming in from third parties. You may have your own, well, company, division, unit, layer which adds certain features which are commodity um, to all of your devices in a series or in a, in a department. Um, and then you specifically have product layers where you describe specifically the differences in the, the products and the configuration. So adding your own image. Um, yeah, as I said, first step, either derive from the, from the template file that's there um, there are some of these two images already provided. There's also a variant available which describes additional uh, debug packages. It's also a normal case that you have a production, a release image, and a, and a debug image. And yeah, you can extend basically on this base image what is available there, adding your things. So this is a um, typical task to be done there is, yeah, adding some additional packages to the list. So there is the variable describing that image pre-install. Um, you can, this is for packages from coming from binary sources from the repository, upstream repositories. If you have self-bit packages, you use the image install variable for this. Um, add files from, uh, I want to add files in your, in your root FS of the target, so customization steps. Um, you can add the task, which is basically doing this. So shown on the right side is some task which um, uh, copies over from your uh, repository, from, from your uh, layer, um, in this case, a host key for the target device, drops it in basically on the root of S. Well, that's trivial as it is on this uh, slide. Um, or you can also modify post-process, so to say, your image, removing stuff, removing, for example, the package database if you don't want it on the target device, um, so there's a, as a, a bootstrap script or a post-processing script available. Uh, it's a Debian config script um, where you just can, well, add your own thing, fork it, or modify it in a way that you can reuse it part. This is, um, well, basically scripting. And then you can modify the, the target systems further into your needs, strip it down, and things like this. So next step might be adding your own applications to this. So two options, basically. One is to let ESA do the, the build process while the image is being produced. And the other one is, which is also being used in the uh, internal projects um, that uh, well, ESA rose from, um, is having a separate build process for the, uh, those packages or those applications coming in as Debian packages already into the central repository and just pull it as if they were upstream packages. So both are possible. But if you look at the, or if you want to look at the source-based approach now, um, well, one approach is, uh, typical approach is to Debianize these kind of sources. That means adding a, repo, um, a folder with the necessary metadata according to the Debian format. And yeah, then let um, Debian basically do the work for you. Um, if you are building natively and you are lucky, then this is, well, you don't have to, do any kind of cross-building. Maybe don't do cross-building actually with ESA, um, anything but is not for the target, and the same target architecture is done in a QEMO um, environment, a related environment. Um, well, just to ensure that we not have to have a cross tool chain at this point. Um, yeah, and then of course you have to add this additional package, uh, would be done in the local config just for experiments, or you add it in your own image recipe um, as a yeah, static hook, so to say. So on the right, you see the example of such kind of application here. It's not awfully complex, and this code alone actually describes everything which is needed for this specific package build. So the, the Git repository where you have to pull it from, the hash you want to use there, um, and it inherits here on the top, you, on the bottom, you see inherits the DPKG uh, class 
which um, describes how to build this package with the Debian way, so basically wraps around uh, the Debian uh, build process. And that's it. So now you have your own application, but normally what you also customize in your embedded system is the kernel for various reasons. So what to do with the kernel? Well, similar approach. Um, you can Debianize the kernel, so you add um, uh, the specific folder describing how the kernel is to be built, and let ESA, ESA do the work. Um, so there's an uh, available an ex example branch on the upstream project, custom kernel. Um, there's just a little bit fix up needed for the URI used in this description, and that basically pulls a demonstration kernel in and, and builds this thing within the ESA build process for a target image. Or, and alternatively to this, um, well, you can build it separately, just like the application, do it outside of the normal image uh, uh, production process and just pull in from a repo uh, uh, already built Debian package. That's one way to do it, um, but if you want to put, or we want to pull in some, some uh, kernel sources in an unmodified way, um, there's also another mechanism possible. That's what was, I was playing with these days. Basically, carrying the, the meta files to Debianize the kernel um, inside the recipes and um, only applying them as you prepare the kernel sources for the build process within Debian. That allows you basically to pull from yeah, unmodified Git repositories um, from upstream or different branches like stable branches, for example. Um, well, and of course, well, we don't want to do this over and over again with every kernel variant we are pulling in, so the next step would be to make this kind of pattern reusable for your own kernel. And even possibly carry over this pattern also to application, that's another step to be done or could be done if you have, for example, um, an auto tools based build process for your application, you can just write the same um, set of, of Debian packages, uh, Debian meta files for this kind of build process, and you can reuse it as well. So how does it look like if you want to split up this kind of um, build process in a usable part? Um, so I patched a little bit on the, on the meta layer and adding basically um, a folder which is for building kernels, Linux kernels. So it consists of a set of these uh, meta files for Debian to produce this in, in Debian, and an include file which describes the common part of the build. Um, this include file basically has, yeah, describing um, the standard build process. Uh, it's including the Debian folder that is on the left side. It's also expecting that the, the final recipe will provide some dev config for the kernel. And last but not least, it's the Instruction you see below, that is basically the step needed, needed to put over the, the Debian folder and before the build process starts and also copies in the, uh, the dev config for the build. And that's basically what you have to do now if you want to use this kind of pattern. You just create in your own layer a little uh, folder with containing the dev config and containing little recipe. The recipe is looked like this. It just pulls in the include file and then describes what repository should provide uh, the kernel, which branch, which source refs, and you're done. That's it. So there's another example available for uh, customizing the bootloader, in this case U-Boot. That's also available in the custom branch, and now uh, pushed upstream. So just look into it. It's, it's basically just the same pattern. In this case, uh, what was done in upstream is um, uh, putting or setting up an uh, U-boot fork which contains just the additional the, the Debian uh, files. But of course, the pattern I just presented for the kernel could be applied on this as well. So just the same, so to say. So last step, basically, before you have a fully bootable image is, well, Describing how the image should look like with the layout, as partitions possibly, and, and um, yeah, how these things should be done, should be laid out on the, on the final image file. So there are good examples available in this case for the recipe. Um, first of all, the, the machine this, this defines what kind of image should be built 
for this machine. Um, so the image type variable defines basically where, um, where to look for uh, what kind of uh, class describes um, the, the build process of the image. And that, again, this class file contains then um, yeah, a list of, of shell commands in this uh, additional task described here, this, in this case, RPI as the image generations task. Uh, a list of shell commands, I didn't list it here, they are a bit longer, um, basically creating uh, the, the, the structure um, on your SD card image file, putting in the, um, the root file system image there, putting in the bootloader at the right location and things like this, setting up these all things. And at the end, yeah, you have this image done in these manual steps, but encoded in the, in the task here. And you add the task in the bit bake way before um, the, the actual build is done and after, well, the root file system has been produced. That's the dependency expression here. So that's basically the steps if you want to build your own images. And well, we played so far. I was hoping to do really a complete bootstrap of, an, of a new device this way, but I didn't finish quite in time for the presentation. Uh, but of course, we tried the individual steps and um, learned some stuff of this. Oh, I skipped something. Ah, ah important point, right. Because one of the things that you see here um, that uh, the general description to be done for the image production, of course, is not specific to ISA, not specific to Debian. So if you produce um, a, a Raspberry Pi image, you have basically to do the same steps independent of what sources you're pulling in. Um, so the vision, for example, for this part is to reuse this and share this with other projects. For example, we are thinking of using or reusing VIC for um, the image production step, um, pulling this in and not open coding it like it's done right now uh, manually. So back to the top, um, what lessons did we learn from the experiments? Well, the good things about Ether, um, the similarity between Yocto and OpenBedded helps a lot when writing the recipes. So you don't have to learn a complete new build systems if you switch over from Yocto, for example. Um, it's the same language, the same structuring of layers. That's the benefit you pull over. Um, so I'm not an expert in both of them. So for me, it was pretty easy my lose my little knowledge in, in Yocto builds um, and applying it basically on the ESA build. Um, the recipes, as you've seen, can become very simple because all the magic is in the back. It's in the distribution. It's the distribution build process. Um, the image generation itself out of the binary package is nicely fast. So it's been done maybe in 10 minutes or even less for a complete embedded system. Try this with a sufficiently complex source built build system. And the structure of ESA so far is rather simple. Um, so it's just 300 lines of code. Um, well, for the differentiating part, the non-differentiating part, Bitpick, of course, a little bit bigger. Uh, but yeah, well, anyway, it's not changed. So it's just existing code. And if someone would package Bitpick basically uh, as a package, we could maybe just use it as is and don't have to carry it our own version. But of course, there are also shadow sites, and in this case, well, we also find some things. One thing that first of all came up for me when I first looked at it, um, you currently need uh, root privileges for generating the image. It's not really nice if you have a, a build server which uh, then tries to execute it and um, you have to set some uh, pseudo rules to enable the build process. This is probably fixable, or you just put it in the virtual machine, like I did for this. Um, yeah, but still, it should, be, it should be done better, and other systems show that this is possible, technically. Um, well, there's some room for improvement, definitely, for the, the recipe development itself. So this is, this is the first thing, that some recipes aren't really update or are not really rebuilt when you change them. It's apparently in a bit back issue. Um, there might be some workarounds for this or some solutions for this in the recent version of Bitpick that not applied here. So I had to fight a little bit while I was playing with the recipes to rebuild things, um, manually destroying some of the files which basically tag the stages, so the, the timestamp files, and trying to trigger the thing in the right way to do it. And yeah, there's also no cleanup task implemented yet. Trivial things, but still, if you do it the first time, it was not the best experience at this point. Um, well, on the to-do list by now. 
Another thing you quickly learn, um, well, we don't do the cross build so far. Um, that's nice. You can use the upstream toolchain as is. Um, it's not so nice if you're sitting there and waiting for your kernel. Uh, usually, this user space or QME user space build uh, based build processes, they take 10 times as the native build or the cross build. And so this is maybe okay, and it's being actually used for the building of the existing uh, in-house system um, this way. It's okay if you have a large server farm, if you just put it there and run it overnight. It's not okay if you're sitting there as a developer in front of your console and waiting for the image. Um, so one approach to do this is, uh, to overcome this, is to uh, switch back, at least for the kernel, to uh, cross-building. The kernel is nicely cross-buildable, um, so not a big issue, but still it has to be done. Or the alternative to this, well, ARM servers are coming, some of them are already in the racks, um, and they, of course, have a different performance than if they have to build for the ARM systems, at least. So what is next? What's in the queue for changes? Um, well, the findings that we have done during the, uh, the evaluation, they are on the to-do list now and should be resolved soon. Some were already resolved just before this presentation. Um, X86 support is something we look into. There are some traces for the pits for this already for QEMO, but the real system is basically waiting on our desk to be uh, yeah, bootstrapped this way. So we want to add a reference board for, for X86, definitely. Um, Jesse is being enabled, so the Jesse version of, of Debian is enabled um, in, in the development branch. It has to be integrated to master, and some fixes have to be done still there. Um, yeah, and then the image creation via Vic, as I mentioned before, is something nicely shareable between existing um, other build systems and, and ESA. So Vic itself has its pros and cons, but we are working on this already for the Yocto part, um, so we will probably reuse it also here. And yeah, documentation can always be improved, you know. It has been improved already recently. So you may wonder now, problem solved, one size fits it all. Dump all the builds from source. Um, no, not really. So one of the devices that we are shipping now is a nice one which shows that you still have a need for <laughs> source build. Um, that's the Simatic IoT 2000. It's an industrial IoT platform device. Um, containing a processor with, a, well, some erratum. So we need to work around in the tool chain. It's one reason to change the tool chain and one reason to not be able to use your pre-built distro packages because no uh, distribution out there supports this kind of processor out of the box. So what we did for the product release, we created a Yocto layer for it, which enables you as a customer, as a user of this device, to build your own distribution for that. That's the normal way if you have to build from source code. But of course, there are also other reasons to do this. Um, well, highly optimized systems. Typically, if you go down for size for whatever reason, um, we are typically with our devices not in the domain where you really have to count the bits in your flash, uh, but there are that kind of devices in the market. <coughs> or if you have to go down um, optimizing for performance. May it be that you have to apply some, some compiler switches to, to squeeze out the last performance bits from your hardware, or that you have to tune the boot times of your system. Um, then you may also go for the source build and drop certain approaches that the distributions are taking, which are maybe not applicable for your specific embedded devices. So to summarize, um, well, I still think, despite all the small itches we still have, ESA is a promising framework for building embedded uh, Debian images. Um, the edges we found so far, well, um, they, I think they are fixable and they will be fixed probably soon. So that's not a blocking point. Um, very interesting and very important point of ESA is that, that code sharing and the recipe sharing is in the center. That means you can uh, build your product lines <clears throat> um, using, reusing the description that you made um, this way. So you don't have to rewrite basically your, your bootstrap script all the time and, and copy it over. But also it enables um, sharing common steps in building embedded systems with other solutions. May they be source-based or may they be distribution-based. So there is room for collaboration, and ESA is already reaching out, or we're already reaching out to these mentioned 
LB and Mita Debian uh, people here, um, and they are in, in contact basically trying to define what the next steps to work on together is uh, useful. So for example, LB is thinking about using Bitbake internally, Mita Debian is also be thinking about basically what to do with um, the, the bootstrapping process, the image generation process. Um, and I specifically think it's a very nice tool if you are living in both worlds, and that's what we are going to do for the future, definitely. If you have your, your source-based uh, Debian, uh, sorry, sorry, your source-based Jocto-based devices there, um, and your, your Debian-based devices, uh, you can use now the same similar, very similar language to describe the build process of both. Um, you don't have to learn two completely different approaches for building embedded devices. And that, of course, is valuable if you have to deal with a large set of embedded systems. So some resources if you want to dig near. And otherwise, thank you for your attention and um, taking questions, of course. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, okay, the question was how to express dependencies between the packages. So I, in my examples here for the self-built application, there were no dependencies expressed, but you have the same mechanism to express it like you have in Jocto. The depends variables and R depends variables, you can just add them where they are not part of the Debian upstream packages. So if you, if you take an upstream Debian packages, they are already encoded in. So if you say install me X, um, X pulls in the dependencies automatically and the normal dependency uh, process of Debian works. But if you describe your own source-based package, you may have to add a specific, these kind of dependencies in variable form. So th this is in the examples that you find in the meta ESAR repository, um, but it's not a part of the slide set here. Does that answer your question? Ah, okay. So um, the Debian package built out of this process, if you want to put in the dependencies there, you have to uh, put it into the metadata, just like you do with Debian packages. So there is currently no automatic process. If you express it in the recipe, the dependency, there is no automatic translation to transfer this into the, into the Debian uh, meta files. Could be done technically. I um, don't think there's anything like this already uh, in place. But yeah, possible and probably makes some sense in certain scenarios, yeah. So you're pulling upstream Debian packages. Yes. Uh, So the question is, how is the consistency between the upstream binary package we pull in and the self-bit packages we have um, in, during the ESA build process? So this, this relies on the fact that we are using the upstream tool chain available um, from the binary sources um, for the build process of our own self-built packages. Um, if Debian doesn't fulfill this requirement, well, then we are lost, but this is something we can, I think, reasonably expect from, from Debian that you can rebuild your own packages with the upstream tool chain that you can get also a consistent um, package result out of this. So the question is if we thought more in details about the cross compilation option that I brought up. Um, I personally not. Uh, it's just uh, I developed the feeling that someone should look into this. Um, and I briefly discussed with the maintainer, Bazan Magulov of, the, of ESA, and he said, yeah, possible, but it has to be done. Um, what technically has to be done for this? So first of all, um, yes, there is upstream uh, available cross-build cross toolchain for, for ARM, for example, ARM v7, ARM v8. That would be the first step to use. Um, and well, but it has to be examined in more details how, what the restrictions are. And 
Probably, I think uh, the pattern will remain that your, your production version will do native builds, so will run in QEMO, just to have the insurance that this is consistent. But for the development phase, where the developer, the kernel developers, maybe sit there and, and want to build an image while being able to build the kernel, um, they may go this fast path. So this is probably not the version you want to apply for the production version. And this is actually, this was picking up from a colleague of mine who looked into this and immediately started switching over the kernel build doing out of tree in a crossway uh, on his desktop and just used Ether for generating the root file system. Yeah, the kernel is easy and we, we don't want to open the, the can for all the packages there. Um, so if you, if you look at uh, Bajan's presentation uh, from Fostem, for example, he also has a pattern um, to be further developed, but conceptually it's there how to deal with uh, modified upstream packages. So if you have to open an upstream package, maybe modify something, apply a patch or something like this, then you, the question arises as well, um, how to deal with it. And I think this is probably most reasonable to keep it in the, in the QEMA environment, build it with the same tool chain it was originally built and not going for cross in that case. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, the question is how do we, what's our feeling about uh, reproducibility uh, using the Debian tool chain um, over a longer period? Um, okay, plus the, yeah, the variation that we have. Um, well, this is currently based on the, on the experience we have with doing basically roll your own Debian version for a long period. Um, so far it works. Um, there might be some corner cases that we didn't run into with the existing Debian-based products, um, but this is something, of course, to keep in mind. Um, and if it really turns out to be the viable way by using the upstream Debian toolchain for a 15-year-old product, um, well, it probably needs further thoughts. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't blindly apply it. Uh, but on the other hand, these kind of system exist not yet 10 years, but at least five years something, um, and they didn't explode yet, um, so it's not completely infeasible. But yeah, um, if we identify problems, and that's also the one of these approaches here, we want to go upstream, we want to talk upstream, so if we identify problems in the Debian way of maintaining tool chains or other as elements um, for maintaining it that long, and Debian is targeting for, I think, seven years or longer with the maintenance of, of their uh, uh, versions, um, we, of course, would report or even fix upstream the issues and to make them reusable for us again. Other questions? Otherwise, thank you all and enjoy lunch. <laughs>